Since 1915, the Pac-12 conference has inspired athletes and fans alike. Conference, as we know it, appears ready to implode. Washington and Oregon, they're going to head to the Big Ten, while Arizona State, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah, the four corner schools, if you will, are all headed to the Big 12. Unfortunately, because of everything going on in the media world, these two programs have gotten completely screwed and they will be left behind. It must have been hammered over a thousand times since the news came out this last summer. The last Pac-12 football game has been played between Oregon and Washington, and soon enough the lights will go out on the baseball, track, softball, basketball seasons as well. While the conference will still technically live with two members, Oregon State and Washington State, the other ten members have found themselves homes elsewhere, symptoms of consolidation among power conferences in this darkening age of college sports. It's no longer about regional identities, academics, or even athletics. It's about money and surviving and advancing. And the Pac-12 failed to do that. But rewind about 15 years and the opposite was about to take place. The conference, then just the Pac-10, was mere minutes away from establishing the killing blow on the Big 12 conference and becoming the NCAA's first 16-team power super conference by inhaling nearly the entirety of the Big 12 South in one foul swoop. It sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? This concept of picking apart other power conferences to get a leg up on the rest isn't anything new. But had one person changed their mind, it's entirely possible that modern college sports as we know it is forever changed. It's time we ask the question, what if the Pac-10 became the Pac-16 in 2010? Let's understand the situation first. We'll start with the first major player, the Big 12. After the Big 8 merged with the Southwest in 1996 to add Texas Tech, Texas A&M, Texas, and Baylor, their standing as a conference had risen considerably. From 1997 to 2009, the Big 12 had sent three teams to eight football national championship games. Nebraska in 1997 and 2001, Oklahoma in 2000, 2003, 2004, and 2008, and Texas in 2005 and 2009. In basketball, Kansas had continued to run dominant, this time alongside those very strong Southern teams going to championship games in 2003 and 2008. I bring this up because it still wasn't enough to hold the conference together. You see, the Big 12 had always been an unholy alliance of sorts. It was one of the first conferences created solely based on TV viewership. The Big 8 and Southwest were struggling to match TV viewership numbers from other conferences like the SEC and Big 10, so they merged to increase their footprint and therefore dollars. Yes, the Big 12 was never about geography or rivalry, it was always about money. And the big dogs in the Southwest, Texas and A&M, weren't getting enough of it. When it became apparent that the Southwest wasn't working, Texas didn't originally go to the Big 8. They went to the Pac-10 in 1990, but were shot down by Stanford. Even in 1994, when initial conversations about creating the Big 12 were being had, Texas still had wandering eyes, specifically for the Pac-10. So the interest was already there, and it was mutual. Fast forward a few years to 2010, and things in the Big 12 are getting dicey. Texas's stature as one of the largest universities in the country, much less the conference, had rubbed some high-ranking members of their conference mates the wrong way, specifically at the University of Nebraska. While the university themselves stated the move was to increase the academic profile of the university, change the university's identity, and provide the university with significant financial benefits, there was always something behind the curtain. According to Nebraska fan site Corn Nation, the Big 12's constant concessions to Texas at the expense of its other powers, like Nebraska, was a prime reason why the Cornhusker brass was so willing to step away from the only home it ever knew just to get away from the domineering Texas had over the rest of the schools in conference. But it wasn't the final step. Their main reason for leaving was because the Big 12 was about to fall apart. On June 7, 2010, the Pac-10 conference, full of highly academic institutions like Cal and Stanford, as well as athletic powerhouses like Oregon and USC, had come to the conclusion that they could further grow their brand by going nuclear. Two other conferences, the Big Ten and SEC, had begun their move towards becoming the strongest conferences in the NCAA. And with that came more money. They had to get out in front of them. And they'd do that by absorbing half the Big 12. The crown jewel, of course, would be Texas. Texas is one of the country's most respected universities with a wide range of both reach and power within the state system. They'd be the easiest to pry away considering they had expressed interest in joining the conference in the past as well as expressed an interest in improving their brand, which joining the Pac-10 would most certainly do. 
They demanded unequal revenue sharing because they made more money than some of the other schools, namely in the Big 12 North. They were, quite literally, too big for that conference. They joined the Big 12 to build their brand, and in our timeline, they left it to build their brand. It's all business with the Longhorns, no sentimentality to it whatsoever. That's how it's always been, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But Texas on their own would be too far away to add, and their lonesomeness made them an impossible ad. They'd have to bring travel partners. Luckily, there were many of them. The instability of the Big 12 hadn't just made Nebraska uneasy. Colorado's place in the Big 12 had also been something of an issue for Buffalo Brass. Like Texas, the university had spent some time aiming to become more like the California universities it attempted to emulate. With it becoming apparent that Texas was looking to leave, as well as Nebraska, they were another easy expansion choice as well. In between Colorado and Texas is the state of Oklahoma. The Sooners were arguably the Big 12's second biggest brand and also demanded a larger piece of the revenue pie compared to schools like Iowa State or Baylor. They were also a very well-respected academic force. Like Nebraska, they had also been a longtime member of the Big 12 in its historical iterations, but its current instability meant that going somewhere else wasn't just a good option, it seemed like the only option. Despite courting the SEC since 1991, Texas A&M was also open to joining a new conference, if it meant Texas's large voice was somewhat muffled. They were already years deep into flirting with the SEC, so that was their preferred outcome. But if the PAC wanted to create a super conference, it'd be very hard to pass up. Texas Tech and Oklahoma State, as other branches of the state regencies for Oklahoma and Texas, would come along for the ride to help flesh out a now 16 Eastern branch of a PAC-16 conference. The PAC-10 invited all six schools. The first to jump to accept was Colorado, who, as mentioned before, had spent some time aiming towards Western affiliation. Nebraska, seeing the writing on the wall, accepted an invitation the very next day to the Big Ten to become that conference's 12th member. With the Big 12 down two pillars and left with only 10, it was officially every school for themselves, and the cards were in the Western Six's hands. Pac-10 Commissioner Larry Scott immediately put on the full-court press. He flew to the campuses of those prospective universities to persuade them to join. Texas Tech, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State were eager. Texas A&M still wanted to weigh membership between the SEC and Pac, almost assured they would leave the Big 12 too. But if they didn't act fast enough, Scott warned, he would add KU instead. The big question lied with Texas. And they said no. Texas themselves would later reveal that they decided against joining the pack for travel reasons. But others, namely Larry Scott, disagreed. After the dust settled, Scott himself revealed why he believed the Longhorns eventually backed off, leading to the other four schools that hadn't already joined getting cold feet. As ESPN reported, it had everything to do with the Pac-12 network and the Longhorn network. Straight up, the Longhorn network was an impediment. Reading between the lines, we can determine that Texas's refusal to throw their network away would have created issues with the Pac, who was in the process of starting their own conference network. Once Texas backed off, so too did A&M, Tech, OU, and Oklahoma State. The whole debacle lasted just a few days. Missouri and A&M would soon find homes in the SEC, the Pac-11 turned to Utah as a rebound to get to 12 teams, and the reeling Big 12 added West Virginia and TCU to stay afloat for nearly a decade. But what if the deal had gone through? What if Texas had decided that the Longhorn Network was a worthy trade to establish what would be, in 2010, the most prestigious academic and athletic conference in the entirety of the NCAA? What would have happened to the remaining Big 12 teams, to the Pac-16, the SEC, to college sports as we know it? To start, we'd need to examine what this new Pac-16 would look like. The original Pac-12 moved to two divisions in 2011 with the additions of Colorado and Utah, the North and South. But with 16 teams, two 18 divisions might not have been the best way to split the difference. Despite Texas A&M being a lean towards the SEC, for the sake of this hypothetical, we'll say they join this new Pac-16 instead of joining the SEC. That gives us a conference of Washington, Washington State, Oregon, Oregon State, Stanford, Cal, USC, UCLA, Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, Texas, and Texas A&M in 2011. It also creates one heck of a hypothetical about Oklahoma State. The 2011 Cowboys, led by quarterback Brandon Whedon, were one of the strongest teams in college football that season, defeating strong teams like number 17 Kansas State and number 11 Oklahoma. 
They had one of the most electric offenses in the country and entered the second to last week of the season ranked number two in the country in the BCS. Win out and they'd make the BCS national title game. But they were also party to tragedy. On November 17th, 2011, Oklahoma State women's basketball coach Kurt Budke was on board a donor flight that unexpectedly crashed near Perryville, Arkansas. He did not survive. This rocked the university, as Bud Key was one of the most well-respected members of Polk Athletics. A day later, the demoralized Cowboy squad trudged into Jack Trice Stadium in Ames, Iowa, where they would lose to Iowa State in double overtime, killing their chances of playing for the national championship. But had the Cowboys joined a relatively lackluster Pac-12, whose strongest teams would have been in the West and without a large chance they would have played Oklahoma State in the regular season, it's entirely likely that OSU ends their regular season undefeated. Of course, it's silly to assume a conference membership change could save Coach Budke's life, and in some ways it feels disrespectful to him and his legacy in Stillwater to even consider that. But as a Pac-16 member, Oklahoma State would not have played Iowa State in 2011 at the very least. If they lost, it would have to be to another team. But likely an Eastern team, like Colorado or Texas A&M, teams that 2011 squad had a great chance of beating. Given that they defeated Stanford in their bowl game, it's not outside the realm of possibility that the Cowboys would have met Oregon in the Pac-12 title game in 2011 with a solid chance of winning. Had they done that, they might have won the national championship. But OSU's loss to Iowa State was enough to kick them to number three in the BCS, creating a widely panned national championship rematch between LSU and Alabama instead of the Pokes. This game against ISU is widely considered the final straw for the creation of the college football playoff as opposed to the BCS. But had OSU never played Iowa State, it may not have been ushered in so quickly. Or not. Remember the butterfly effect? One small change in the timeline could spur a string of drastic changes over time making these hypotheticals nearly impossible to predict. But it's fun to think, anyway. What about some of the other teams? Well, Oregon and Washington had no trouble establishing themselves as the new bloods in the pack in real life. Adding dominant schools like Oklahoma to that list may have proven that to be more difficult, especially as the former Big 12 team's recruiting grounds began to naturally shift west due to conference affiliation. But of course, what you've been waiting for. The Pac-16 likely doesn't lose their members to other conferences in 2022 simply because they are the mega conference, and they had been for over 10 years at that point. Would A&M eventually decide to split away from Texas to join the SEC like they'd always wanted to do? Uh, maybe, especially if the SEC felt threatened by the Pac's emergence as a superpower. We'll get to that later, though. But it does likely mean more than anything that the Pac-16 survives. It would have potentially jumped the SEC or Big Ten in the money line despite their track record of national champions. Imagine Johnny Football against Oregon for a conference championship in 2012, or Oklahoma versus Washington for a shot at the college football playoff in December of 2016. The Pac-16 may have become one of the most entertaining conferences in college sports history, and most importantly, they'd still be here today. But what are the Big 12? Well, they probably die. Now left with just Baylor, Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, and Missouri, the conference would have fallen below the 50% margin that was widely considered the Mendoza line to keep the conference together. While moves like adding Utah or TCU would have made sense, it's entirely possible the schools just decide to group together and go somewhere else. That somewhere else, if we were to believe Kansas head basketball coach Bill Self, would have been the Big East. While this may seem like a bit of a stretch, considering the Mountain West was being very loud in its admittedly pathetic courting of those schools, you have to look at the environment college sports would have been placed in. While some power conferences were just getting to 12, like the Big Ten, the Pac-12 would have gone supernova. This would have been immensely threatening to some of those conferences, none so more than the Big East, whose teams were being pulled on by other conferences. But if we read between the lines from self, we can see that the SEC and Big Ten didn't have any interest in adding the former Big 12 schools if things were to fall apart. At least not then. So the Big East it was. The 2010 Big East was famously made up of two parts. A football playing branch and a basketball playing branch, with teams joining for other sports somewhere in the middle. The Catholic Seven, as they were called, would essentially split from the Big East in the real timeline due to its insistence on adding football or otherwise all sports schools to keep it afloat in the football sphere. The football branch had only eight members in 2010. UConn, West Virginia, Pittsburgh, Syracuse, USF, Louisville, Cincinnati, and Rutgers. They had already been in talks with schools like TCU and Boise State to enhance their football playing schedule, 
simply just to stay alive. Had the Pac-16 been formed, five power conference schools would have simply fallen into their laps. The Big East would have happily added KU, K-State, ISU, and Mizzou, maybe even Baylor, as all sports members in 2011, with TCU coming along to help further solidify presence in Texas, essentially creating a new Big 12 out of the now 14-team Big East. While these brands are also excellent basketball brands that the Catholic 7 would have been interested in playing, it's unlikely that they would stick around to play them. The Big East would have stuck its flag firmly in the all-sports ground. It would have to settle with being an elite basketball conference instead of being an elite basketball conference with private Catholic schools. Self notes a division system where the Western teams would have been in a Western division, while the more Eastern teams would have been in a more Eastern division. Now, looking at this roster of Big East teams, it's easy to see some potential issues, namely the amount of teams that would eventually leave for other conferences. Syracuse and Pittsburgh joined the ACC in 2013. West Virginia joined the Big 12 in 2012. Rutgers joined the Big 10 in 2014, and Louisville would also join the ACC in 2014. It's entirely possible that the Big 12 dying keeps these teams from being so keen on moving to other conferences, as adding five, borderline six, genuine power teams to a conference might have been enough to keep it afloat. But if 16 was the goal, then 16 they'd likely get to, especially if Utah had still not been added by a conference yet. While Boise State had been in contact with the conference about membership before, BYU would have also made sense to add as conference mates with the Utes. It's entirely possible that the Big East, potentially now the American Athletic Conference earlier than in our timeline, or having gained the Big 12 name from its newcomers, tries to get out ahead of the other conferences in solidifying itself as another super conference. But again, it's impossible to tell. As for the performance of these newly Big East teams, it's very hard to tell how conference affiliation would have changed their seasons. KU would have likely continued to perform well in basketball in a conference that is significantly more deep-rooted in the sport, with yearly matchups against a surging UConn squad as well as historical powers Cincinnati and Louisville keeping them a strong program. K-State's football recruiting or approach would likely not have changed much under Bill Snyder, who was famously frugal in recruiting and got the most out of what he had. Considering the Cats' 2012 performance over West Virginia, it's likely they dominate the Big East as well. Colin Klein versus Teddy Bridgewater would have made for an electric conference championship game. The Big Ten would eventually come to try and add two more major market schools in 2013, making the next part incredibly difficult to predict. The additions of Rutgers and Maryland probably wouldn't have been contested by the Big East or ACC, but the conference doesn't lose Louisville in response either, potentially making UCF or some other Conference USA team an ACC school in this alternate timeline. Texas A&M would likely grow tired of Texas again, especially if the SEC was still keen on expanding to keep up, meaning they likely leave to join the SEC at some point close to the 2020s. If Utah hadn't been added by the Big East and was still a free agent, there's a likelihood they fill Texas A&M's empty spot in the Pac-16. The SEC may have gone after Mizzou or West Virginia from the Big East to get to 14 from 13 had they added the Aggies. Maybe the Big Ten bails on Maryland and adds Mizzou or KU from the Big East to grab the KC market instead of the DC one. Maybe Notre Dame throws their hands in the air and decides to join a conference. Maybe it was destined for the Big East to collapse, even with schools like Iowa State and Baylor. Or maybe everyone stays put, and the Big 12 dying keeps the Big East alive longer than the 2020s. Again, it's impossible to tell. It's hard to tell what teams would go where in a timeline this muddied and different from our own. I'd like to hear your thoughts on what would have happened in the comments below. One thing is for certain, however, college sports would have looked much, much different than it had in real life had the Pac-16 been formed in 2011. And in some small way, we have Larry Scott and the Longhorn Network to thank for that.